I'm Bill Hemmer. This is Hemmer Time. Carl Rove, big welcome back to you. How are you doing, my friend? And good day. I'm doing great. Now, if it's Hemmer Time, does that mean you do the dance? And wearing the gold pants and stuff. I, I will do that with, yeah, we'll, we'll add the music later on that. I mean, that's a sight to see, actually, Carl. Yeah, I bet it is. Yeah, I remember, you know, you one time uh, cutting a move at the White House Correspondents' Dinner. Oh, God. At the lead table. Oh, God. One of the, one of the but, darkest moments of my life. They suckered you, know? you into that moment. Well, they, they didn't sucker <laughs> me into it. I, I, I was with the president, with President Bush at the, pre-gathering uh, at the White House Correspondents' Dinner, and the evening entertainment came in, and I ended up talking to one of them, and I think he was surprised that I didn't have a tail and horns, so we <laughs> sort of hit it off. But then you may remember these guys uh, did some uh, after-dinner skit entertainment, and yes. so they looked for volunteers from the crowd, and they drew uh, they drew me out of the crowd deliberately and made me dance. Well, and, I, I was in the audience, and I thought yeah, you were – no, you were you were a good sport. That's how I saw it. Good, look, I wasn't a good sport until I decided I'd better be a good sport. But I'm Norwegian, and we don't dance. So having <laughs> out there, you know, break the moves like to a rap song is like ridiculous because I have no rhythm whatsoever, and it showed. But anyway, it's anyway. all it's all good. Listen, we're a hundred days away, and I wanted to talk to you exclusively, uh, give or take a hundred days. Right by the time this goes out, would you agree with that? Yeah, I thought your Wall Street Journal piece last week was excellent. So for those who were not lucky to witness the mastery of your prose, size it up for us. How do you see the strangest campaign play out, the strangest campaign of our lifetimes play out? Well, as I said in the in the column, I mean, COVID-19 has transferred so many things in our society. I mean, the way that we work the way that our kids get educated, the way, whether or not we travel, just a simple human interactions. Who would have thought a year ago, we'd be all going to the grocery store and masking up and deliberately trying to keep our carts six feet away from anybody else. And politics hasn't escaped it. And it starts with the national conventions. Actually, that's the most visible uh, form of the change, but, uh, and they're coming up, but it's not the most important one, but it's, it's, you know, we used to have these, you and I, from 2008 on, have spent time together at both the Republican and Democratic conventions, and they're like Woodstock with these gigantic, you know, crowds of people who, you know, the party enthusiasts, delegates, alternates, party leaders, donors, journalists, strap hangers, people who are curious. Every interest group in the world is represented at them, from, you know, the from people who are both sides of the gun question to, you know, re weird and exotic and bizarre causes. And, and like 50,000 people, for example, were expected to descend on Milwaukee for the Democratic Convention and a slightly larger crowd for the Republican Convention in, in Charlotte, North Carolina. And instead, both of them, you know, the, the, the Democrats have downsized their in-portion portion of the convention, in-person portion, to only the essential committee business and everything else, all the speeches, all the entertainment, all the evening program activity is all virtual. And the Republicans, mm -hmm. they, got, they had to move from Charlotte because the, the governor said, I'm not willing to give you permission to fill up the arena, the veterans arena in downtown Charlotte uh, for the acceptance speech. So they're, they're going to Jacksonville and how they're going to pull this all together is going to be a real challenge because historically the conventions have been the biggest moment that each of the candidates have before the debates. 34 million people tuned in to watch Hillary Clinton's uh, acceptance speech and 35 million watched Donald Trump's. Mm. And how you pull that off without the sort of all the drama and the momentum and the pageantry of what has become the traditional modern political convention is going to be really tough. Yeah, very interesting. I thought the State of the Union address this year was very interesting. You really did not know what to expect. I just thought that they pulled out one character of American life after another. I thought it was very effective, probably yeah. unlike I had ever seen before for a State of the Union address. So who's to say what level of creativity, be it on behalf of the DNC or the RNC, who can be more effective at that presentation? Yeah, that's going to be a big issue for both parties. I mean, uh, 
Democrats are going to have uh, have to figure out how to go about uh, the Democrats and Republicans both how to figure out how to showcase their candidate, because that's a critical moment. I mean, that's the moment at which a lot of people sort of wake up. Yeah, we're paying attention to politics. We're we're sort of, you know, making opinions. But that's the moment at which we hear it all, in which a candidate stands up and says, here are my values. Here are my principles. Here's what I want to do. And here's how I contrast it with what that other person wants to do. And for the incumbent, it's important for them to show, really important for them to show that they got a second act because they can't simply say, vote for me, I've done a good job, uh, reelect me. You got to go out there and lay out, uh, you know, I've done a good job, yeah, but I got a second act in me. And here's how that second act is better than what you're being promised on the other side. Mm. I think about the production often, and what I think about a convention is I think the crowd shots are yeah. kind of, oh, yeah. I mean, that's that's what's been ingrained in our brains ever since, what, FDR showed up at the first one in 1932 in Chicago, Illinois. Uh, let me just lay it out for our listeners. DNC plans four days as of today in Milwaukee, largely virtual, as you point out. That begins August 17th. The RNC is planning for three days in Jacksonville, and I I know they're still pushing for more people and to be uh, a combination of indoor, outdoor. And I think the RNC is still working its – I guess they both are, right? Trying to work through what it will be for that week. Yeah, and I think they have to have official meetings in Charlotte because what happens is they they party uh, rules – I think are such that that they had that they aren't Republican National Committee members have voted to hold the convention in Charlotte, and so they have to have at least some of the official business. There. Okay, so uh, in a moment, I'm going to circle back on the last part of your piece from a week ago and talk about what happens after the conventions, which is the campaign of sixty plus days. Um, but before I get there, Joe Biden gave a speech earlier this week. Um, prior to that, we saw him two weeks ago, went 89 days without a press conference. Um, last week, I think he drove two and a half hours from his home in Wilmington, Delaware, made a speech, went to his childhood home, got back in his black SUV, went back to his home without taking a single question from a national reporter. I think he might have done two or three local interviews there. Is, is that sustainable, Carl? Well, I think they're counting on it being sustainable, but I don't think it can be, um, of course, it, maybe it's going to be sustainable if the national press says, well, we really, you know, we, we, we dislike Trump so much that we really don't care that we don't get a chance to ask him quite tough questions. But um, I, I think it would ill prepare him for the debates. I think it is better for, for him to find a moment where he starts being more visible and more available so that people get more accustomed to him. Otherwise, it raises the likelihood that at the debates, people say, well, you know what, I haven't really heard all that much from him thus far. And uh, you know, he his performance in the debate leaves me wondering, is he up to the job? So let me be clear. It's been advantageous for him to have, to be off the stage and to have the spotlight hot and, and, and consistent on Donald Trump since March, March, April, May, June, July. Think about that. Uh, all that time, it's been Trump, 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 Trump. Mm-hmm. And and he's and he Biden has benefited from being on the sidelines. But at some point, people are going to say, well, who is that guy? You know, I got a general view. He's sort of he's Uncle Joe. He served in the Obama administration as vice president, been around a long while. Seems like an affable sort. But I think there's going to come a point where people say, I need to know more about him. And I think that moment, frankly, is is he, he better he better find a way to be more available uh, sooner rather than later. Now, he's going to try to avoid tough questions from the press because you know, I watch these softball interviews he has with local TV stations, and he runs into difficulty even there. But uh, if the national press said to him, let me give you an example. Um, he uh, he had a speech on the, on his version of the Green New Deal. Well, no member of the press could, could say to him, have you, have you figured out how many jobs that's going to cost in Pennsylvania in the fracking revolution? What about all those chemical, you, you know, members of the chemical workers union? who are going to lose their jobs? What about all those people at refineries around the country who are going to lose their jobs? And how realistic is it to, is to think that in 15 years, within 15 years, we can shut down every coal-fired, every oil-fired, and most important of all, every natural gas-fired uh, power plant in America without having a major disruption of our economy? Those gas, natural gas-powered plants can run for decades, and you want to shut every one of them down within 15 years. 
you know, nobody could ask him that question when he gave that speech because he didn't accept questions and his staff was able just to say. Uh, uh, interesting. So For the full podcast, go to foxnewspodcast.com.